It's a pioneer city in the United States, one of the first to adopt a zero waste goal. Austin, Texas has 950,000 residents and 15,000 restaurants, where everything must now be recycled. Jennifer McNevin runs Manuel's in the city center. It's regional Mexican food, and everything is made fresh from scratch in small batches every single day. Specialties include paella and ceviche. Before, the kitchen produced a lot of waste making these dishes, but now the bin is almost empty. 70% of everything that we were throwing in the dumpster, in the trash before, we are now composting or with the grub tub, or we are recycling. Most of what the kitchen throws away is food waste. Staff now have on hand these buckets, which they fill throughout service to be recycled. My chore list, being a small business owner, is always long, so I never was getting there until the city told me this is coming. So all of a sudden it's like, no, I better get it done. Once full, the containers are stored behind the restaurant. I love to see these because I know that this is food for animals instead of going in the dumpster over there. They fill 200 tubs a month that Robert Olivier picks up twice a week to feed chickens. Good. Airtight. Now we can preserve the proteins as proteins, the fats as fats, the sugars as sugars, and we can bring this to farmers so that we can actually help them grow more food in our community. At the moment, this recycling comes at a cost for Jennifer McNevin, $350 or 300 euros per month. But eventually, my cost for hauling away the trash is going to go down because I'm not putting much anymore in the trash. Austin's restaurants are now bound by law to recycle their waste, but a quick scan of the bins shows not all a plain ball. So what have we got here? Oranges, mushrooms, so food waste, mixed up with plastic. For now, about half of Austin's restaurants recycle. No one's policing them yet, because the council's giving them time to adapt to the new regulations. Until we have the actual equipment, because according to health code as well, we have to have that certain equipment to be able to keep our composting separate. For Austin, recycling has now become crucial. Because just a few kilometers from the city center, its rubbish dump is overflowing. Jenna McKinley runs the city's zero waste program. The council has voted to give restaurants some financial support. And then we also have a zero waste business rebate that's been in place. And it was used really to try and get businesses to be early adopters. So there was up to $1,800 for a business to, to use that money and try to divert materials. No statistics are available yet for the zero waste law. But this pastor who feeds Austin's homeless says he's already noticing a big difference. One of the craziest stories, you guys. The most expensive place to eat at UT is they're going to start giving us food. Twice a week, Pastor Jackson tours the town, collecting restaurants' leftovers. If you serve food, you have to show accountability where it's going and where, what it's going to. In the kitchens of this university, more than 2,000 meals are served every day. Okay, what well, Mark's doing this is what we, we, uh, we have leftovers, we chill them down immediately, and then we put them in the freezer. Sweet potatoes, all kinds of mushrooms. I mean, an unbelievable necessity. Food that's still good is transferred to this truck to feed the homeless. How much are we wasting? How much are we throwing out? How much could we be doing better things with? How do we know? Well, this is how we control all of these things by controlling our costs. So welcome to chapter number eight. This is Chef Hawks. We are continuing our ProStar adventure here. And right now we are looking at our introduction to cost control. Let's look at the basics of our cost control and what we're looking at. So revenue, what is revenue? This is the sales that we're making, the things that we're selling, and the income that we gain from that before the expenses that are subtracted. And then we look at costs. A cost is the expense that's incurred from creating that sale. So we have to purchase things, we have to prepare things, we have to serve products. All of these things have costs associated with them. 
In fact, if we have costs that are higher than our sales, then we're in trouble. Because this means that if our expenses are higher than what we're selling the products for, then the business is losing money and it may not be in business for much longer. This is where cost control comes in. This is where we have specific methods of looking and analyzing all of these, all of this data so that that way we can actually go in there and we can see where we need to make those changes so we can make meaningful changes because we don't want to make changes that make things even worse. Let's take a look at a few examples of where we could have imbalances because this is what it comes down to. So our winter heating costs over on the left hand side here. So this company is losing money and may go out of business if the costs aren't controlled because our winter heating costs are out of control. They're far too high versus the sales that we have. So if our costs are more than our sales, we're going out of business. This company is neither making or losing money, so the costs are exactly the same as our sales. So we're just kind of treading water. But what happens with a business like this is that all of a sudden, if you get that one big bill come in, if all of a sudden you need to replace a piece of equipment, then all of a sudden you are out of business. And then you look over on the right hand side here. So with this case, we still have our sales rolling. And so this company is earning money and has successfully controlled its costs. Because whilst its sales are going up and we've got some good sales, our costs have been reduced. If we had fewer employee hours necessary, maybe because of uh, automation, maybe we got a new machine, which, uh, which meant that we didn't have to have as many employees working on the floor as, as often as we do, then we save money. And so that business is making money, which means that the business will be able to continue. Let's look at the different types of costs that we would have in our restaurant. So we have four main categories, the product, uh, the products or the food costs, the beverage costs, the labor costs, labor costs is the employees, the people who are working there, and then the overhead costs. Overheads are various things like keeping the lights on, keeping the air, uh, air conditioning or the heating going, uh, the rents that you might have to pay or the mortgage you might have to pay on the establishment, all of these things that have to be paid for um, by the business but don't necessarily have those costs um, related directly to the product that you sell. We have different types of costs in that some of them are controllable costs. So a controllable cost can be something like a food cost. We can actually decide how much food we purchase and the price and quality that we're purchasing. Same with our beverages. The labor costs can be controlled. You may be able to analyze that I don't need to have as many employees for that lunch shift um, because I don't have as many customers coming in that need that assistance. But for dinner shift, I might need to have more because we have more diners coming in. So you can control that cost. Anything that incurs when the meals are being uh, or service are being provided. So we have to have someone who is either at the very least ringing up the food if you're in a quick service, fast food restaurant, or if you have servers who are giving full service at the dining table, they must be paid. They may have different rates of pay, but they still have to be paid. All of these controllable, uh, controllable costs can be adjusted uh, to try and make our business more profitable and successful financially. Then we have the dreaded non-controllable or fixed costs. So this is where we have our overhead costs. So these can include things like insurance, utilities, leases or mortgages on your property. So these costs don't change. You have to pay your insurance. You have to pay to keep those lights on. You have to pay the lease or the mortgage on the property that you're working with. You can't just say, because we had 10 less customers in today, I'm going to pay less on my mortgage. It doesn't work that way because you'll have signed a contract that says you agree to pay no matter what. And these are sometimes some of the costs that can, uh, that can be uh, very dangerous to a business because they're very difficult to make any change, any meaningful change to. With our controllable costs, we also look at uh, our food costs. So this is where we use foods to create menu items. The beverage cost, this is where we use different ingredients to make different beverages. It could be something as simple as coffee, where we need to have coffee grounds, and we need to have creamer, 
and we need to have sugar or some kind of a sweetener. You may even have uh, plastic uh, or, or styrofoam cups and then plastic spoons to stir them with. There could be another expense. All of these things are needed to make that beverage. So food and beverage sales go up and down and should do so in, the direct, in direct proportion to the costs. So as our sales go up, then our costs will go up with that as well because I'll have to use more coffee, I'll have to use more cups, I'll have to use more spoons. But it should also go down with less sales as well. For our costs uh, for penny pasta, for instance, if we break this down, so we start off with our costing sheet here. So we have our penny pasta. We're going to need for this recipe four ounces. And so the cost per unit, which is per ounce, is five cents. So 20 cents total for the penny pasta for this particular recipe for that dish. And then the chicken breast. We're going to need five ounces of chicken breast. It's 12, 12 cents per ounce. So it'll be 60 cents for our chicken. Then we do the same thing for our spinach, our flat leaf parsley, our oil, and our Parmesan cheese. So we can work out from here, uh, and our, sorry, with our sun-dried tomato Alfredo sauce, um, then we can add all of this in there, and our, and our salt and pepper as well. We make an allowance for that too. And then that's when we look at our recipe cost is $2.05 per portion. And so our portion cost is $2.05. And so our, our food cost percentage for this is 12.2%. This would give us our gross margin, our profit from this, as $11.85. Let's take a look at this beverage. So we have a Lena Fizz. And so this bar recipe, <clears throat> this is our number 77 bar recipe. If you had this maybe listed behind your bar, so you actually have a list of all your drinks and how much they all cost. So this is, in go this is going to include some 4 ounces of strawberry puree, it's going to be 10 cents, 4 ounces of lemonade, 5 cents, 6 ounces of ginger ale, 6 cents, and a whole strawberry for our garnish, it's going to cost us 8 cents. So the cost on this beverage is 29 cents. We're going to sell this beverage for $3.95, and so if our drink cost was 29 cents, then that means that our cost percentage for this drink is only 13.62%. So we have a great percentage margin here of profit. A lot of businesses actually make their significant uh, profits on their beverages. Now we have a full recipe card where we can actually analyze the pasta sauce with it using our standardized recipe. And standardized recipes are key for us being able to control our costs. So again, we take a look through here. So our recipe amount, we need one pint of olive oil. The invoice cost on that is $112. The invoice unit is four gallons. And so the recipe cost for the amount that we need, which is only one pint out of that four gallon container is $3.50. And so the, the recipe unit is pints, as we've already mentioned. So the cost for this um, recipe is now $3.50 for the oil. Then we go into onions, it's going to work out as 17 cents. For our celery, 46 cents. For our tomatoes, $3. And then 15 cents for our clove of garlic. And then working down all of our Q items that we would normally see, we have our salt, pepper, sugar, oregano, basil, and parsley. So we have all of these items in there too. So this gives us a total cost for this standardized recipe of $7.88. Well then we divide it by the 24 portions that this recipe will produce for. And so that gives us a recipe, uh, a cost per portion of 33 cents. Using standardized recipes, we can control all of this, but this is where you would then need to make sure that we only use one portion at a time. So maybe using a ladle, or some, some other measuring uh, equipment to make sure that every single portion is exactly the right amount so that you don't overserve and end up uh, knocking your cost out of whack. As I said, one of the best ways of controlling our costs is using that standardized recipe. This gives us portion control. Um, we can have it listed on our menu with our pricing. We know exactly what we are, uh, what it's going to cost us and exactly what we can sell it for and still make that profit. 
when we look at our controllable costs, including labor costs, this can get a little tricky. So all of our staff together are what makes up our labor costs. So this goes from management, front of house, um, with the service team and bartenders, to the back of house uh, with all the chefs and cooks and all the um, ancillary staff that work with them as well. Now we can look at these as being controllable costs. However, it can be a little trickier than that. So a lot of the front of house and back of house staff will be paid hourly. And if they do work an hour, then they get paid for that. If they don't work an hour, if they're sent home early, uh, or if they're told to come in later, then the business will pay them less. Now, the one, well, the one uh, fixed item here on these uh, on the labor costing note is with our management. Generally, your management will be paid a salary, and so this means that they are always paid that salary for every week, whether you have a busy restaurant or a quiet restaurant. The only way that you can change this would be to lay one of those managers off. Um, and, but that could be detrimental to the quality of the business after that kind of thing happens. So that's something to always bear in mind when you have labor costs is that they don't necessarily fluctuate as much as a business might need with some fixed costs in salaries. Then we have wages, um, well, wage benefits as well. And so you may have some of your staff who are uh, also offered insurance and a retirement plan of some sort as well. And so insurance and retirement plans are a great way to retain good staff, but it is an additional expense that the business has to bear in mind. And then generally your hourly employees, they're going to be scheduled according to sales. So if you have busier days, like maybe Wednesday is the busiest day, so you'll have more hourly employees scheduled that day. Whereas on Mondays, if that's a relatively quiet day, then you wouldn't because otherwise uh, you're going to end up having a higher labor cost than you will revenue and thus putting yourself out of business. Our overhead non-controllable costs can be a challenge. So these are what we call fixed costs. So this is where our sales volume makes no impact at all to these costs. So like we mentioned before, this can be things like your mortgage, your lease, your power bill, um, they're very, very difficult to make any changes to, and also things like insurance. If I only have 10 customers joining me today, then it still costs me just as much to insure my business as it did when I had 100 come in yesterday. A successful operation needs to manage and control many costs. This is often a balancing act between costs and sales. The four main cost categories are product or food costs, beverage costs, labor costs, and overhead costs. The first three costs, food, beverage, and labor costs, are called controllable costs. This means that they are incurred only when a meal or service is provided to a guest. A manager or chef can manage or adjust these costs based on the operation. For example, food costs and sales may go up and down but they do so in direct proportion. This means that if sales go down, less food should be ordered. This works the same way for beverages. If the cost of an ingredient, like fresh strawberries, rises too much for the drink to be profitable, management can either raise the price or eliminate it from the menu. By taking action, management has controlled the effect of the increased cost of strawberries, resulting in no increase in the restaurant's food cost. Labor costs are the costs of all staff from wages to benefits. Management salaries are part of labor costs and they remain the same regardless of sales volume. However, hourly staff labor costs rise as anticipated sales rise and go down when sales go down. If proper scheduling is used, the cost will go up and down in direct proportion to sales levels. The other type of cost Overhead is a non-controllable cost, or fixed cost. This means the cost stays the same regardless of sales volume. Examples of overhead costs are insurance policies or mortgage payments. These stay the same over time. It is very important for an operation to understand the differences in how all of these costs work and how they can or cannot be managed. This is where we have to work out our operating budget. 
This is how we can start estimating with, with good knowledge and good history just what it is that we can do and what we shouldn't do and what we should be eliminating or what we should be increasing. An operating budget is a financial plan. We take a specific period of time. It might be a year and generally this would then be broken down into calendar months. It could then also be broken down into shorter periods of time as well. We, uh, we use this to manage our operations costs. It helps us to anticipate sales revenue, the money coming in, and also to project the kinds of costs that we have. Because from one month to another, we may have differing costs. You're not going to have the same kind of heating costs in May as you would in January. But you may have air conditioning costs in, in May or June that you don't have back in February. And so then it gives us the ability to estimate um, our profit or loss that we might be expecting. It also helps us to work out our depreciation as well, the value of the products that we own um, as, they start to, uh, as they start to go down in time. The purpose of our operating budget is to predict potential sales. We don't necessarily know for sure, but you may have some advanced bookings, maybe some private parties, maybe a wedding coming in, that so you know you've got some things coming in, but then you have your regular customers too, so hopefully those are fairly sustainable. You know approximately how many people are going to come in. You might know that maybe Wednesday is busier than Mondays, but it helps you to start predicting these types of things because very often businesses have patterns of sales that move around depending on the time of year and the time of the week as well. So this is where we look at our revenue, but then you have to identify your controllable costs, the ones that can fluctuate. That's where you have to work out how much labor am I willing to put in to take care of those customers who, who I'm anticipating coming in? How much food should the chef be purchasing? How much beverages should that bar, bar manager be, be purchasing? And how many supplies uh, should we be purchasing in to take care of what we're anticipating? Too few and we run out of food or we run out of beverages. Too much and we end up having food wastage, uh, especially with foods which go off fast as well. So then we have to note all of our non-controllable costs. We have to make sure we're aware of them and that we're accounting for them. We identify the operating goals and the manager's performance responsibilities are linked directly in with this as well. This will provide us with a benchmark of operations of our operations performance. We have to have things that are measurable. If you cannot measure if you're successful or not, then how will you ever know? Let's take a look at a sample um, operating budget here as to what type of things we're going to be recording. So we have our sales up at the top. So we have our food sales and our beverage sales. Often companies will break these out like this because it gives them the ability to, t to see where they need to be uh, more controlling over certain things. And there may be different managers who are in charge of the food or the beverages that need to be held accountable to those. And then we have our cost of sales, again, breaking it out, separating it between our food and beverage costs involved. In the end, over on the right here, you'll see we do add them together to acknowledge them. But the fact is we keep, we keep them separately first so that we can analyze them better. Then we have our operating expenses. So you've got payroll, how much those employees cost. And then you've got employee benefits, things like the insurance and the retirement plans. Then you have music and entertainment, if we had a band in during the month as well. Repair and maintenance to different pieces of equipment. And then we also have to have um, our other promotional activities. Maybe you had some kind of an event to try and draw in more customers. Or maybe you, uh, maybe you had different materials that you were handing out into the local community. And then you have some administrative costs as well. Because if you have an accountant or someone like that, you have to be able to pay them as well. And then you have your utilities, the lights, the electricity, the gas bill. How much gas did you burn to cook all of that, uh, all of those steaks? It all costs money. We have to account for all of those things, but we do them individually. That way, if suddenly we go from $2,000 one month in our utilities to $3,000 the next month, then, it's, then that's a control that we, that we need to look at, that we need to be uh, working on to be able to bring back under control again. And then we have our occupational expenses. So we have things like our property tax, our rentals, various miscellaneous things in there with that. Our liquor license fees. 
we can't tell the local ABC board that we're not going to pay that much for our liquor license. You just have to pay for it, so you must budget for that. And then insurance, mortgage, your interest that you may be having to pay on any loans, and then any depreciation, the amount of value that your equipment went down in during this last month. And then some other uh, expenses as well that, um, that may be in there in terms of extraordinary costs. So, so things like one-off costs where maybe you purchased a new piece of equipment um, or, an, or an extraordinary um, uh, expense um, that you had to pay off for. But then some extraordinary income may be that you had a, a very large wedding. Well, that wedding won't happen uh, again unless if you book up another couple to have another wedding. Our operating budget is a critical tool. Every single business that's going to be successful must have one. It requires time and care to go over it to make sure it's as precise as we can be, understanding the history of what we've seen so far. This is something we should monitor every single day. If we see costs or if we see revenues either going too high or too low, we need to do something about it rapidly. Don't let it turn into a problem that can sink the business. And this is where we can make changes um, in our sales or in our forecasted costs to be able to react to these things in time. Forecasting is when we start looking at the current business trends. This is where we may be actually looking at a very short period of time um, where we're estimating for future sales and costs that are coming up immediately. This is where we can predict changes that affect our operating budget overall. This is where we can be accurate with using our historical data so that we can actually analyze with our past performance, can we look at this as being possible future performance or hopefully maybe even doing better. This is where we can, out, uh, we can account for outside factors as well. We can actually start recording things like how was the weather that day? Was it a rainy day? Did we get more business from it being rainy because people came in? Did we get less because people didn't go out and leave their homes? The time of year, do we get more business in the middle of summer or do we get less in the middle of winter because it's too cold and people don't want to come because we're right on the edge of the coast? Um, it may also have, in, uh, have information in there about any local construction uh, which blocked our street for a period of time, which may not happen the following year when we're making our operating budget. On the revenue side, this is where we can estimate potential changes that we need to make. Uh, depending on previous sales. Our custom account is recorded as well because we may see a change in that as well. Hopefully it's going up, but it may be going down. What do we need to do to change that? We can also look at the average sales per customer. This is sometimes called the cover charge. We very often call this uh, the number of covers that come into our dining room. And so this is where we can ch have a change in money average per customer that's uh, where they're spending their money so hopefully if they're spending ten dollars per person on average this year next year we might be able to encourage them to spend on average eleven or twelve dollars and there are lots of methods that we can look at to doing this um, and it comes down to having your service team um, being better at sales and more knowledgeable about the products that they can sell to hopefully include or increase this our sales history is a record of every portion that we have sold over a period of time. So this is a moving average technique that we use where we look at the average sales over the course of several months. Uh, the numbers are not based on, uh, on a unique month, but so we, as we can see right over on here with our menu items, so the chicken breast dinner, we sold 867 of these. The seafood platter, we sold 253 of these, working our way all the way through the various different um, menu items. So we have a weekly total of 8,000, 8, sorry, 4,845 total dishes sold. We also would use a production sheet. This is what shows all the items that have been prepared during any given day. This, is help, this helps us to produce the right amount of food on any given day, understanding the averages which are generally ordered. Here's a great example of a blank production sheet. So this is where you're going to record your, the day and the date, so that way you can put this in with other, uh, with other weeks and months as well, to take a look and see if this is a cyclical thing with different months and weeks throughout the year. So you'd record your menu item, the, uh, the recipe number, if you have certain recipe numbers to go with that menu item, the portion size, 
and then the raw quantity that's required, the portion cost. And then after that, we're going to write down any specifics on here. It could be some instructions, some pricing, um, but we're also going to be recording things like the weather or any special conditions which occurred that day as well that could have drastically affected this from one day to the next. Often a lot of businesses will use a point of sale system, a POS, to help us to run historical sales reports and other production reports. This is something that can calculate very quickly for us different, uh, different uh, variances on figures that we may have so that that way we can get projected sales estimates for things like labor needs. So it can help us to see that on Wednesdays we're busier than Mondays, so we need to have more servers. But whereas on Monday, we should cut back on the number of servers we have because we're, otherwise we're going to be going too high on our labor costs. So it helps us to understand things like that for production and for front of house staffing, uh, for kitchen staffing, um, and then for menu item production as well so that we're not overproducing food and beverage items and also then for ordering those food and beverage items to be produced. One of the methods an operation uses to monitor, assess, and try to control costs is through the operating budget. An operating budget is the financial plan for a specific period of time. Most budgets cover a full year and are broken into months. Budgets are an essential tool for managing an operation's many costs. They serve five main purposes in the management of a restaurant or food service operation. The operating budget serves as a way to predict potential sales and where the revenue will come from. For example, predicting high food and beverage sales over a busy holiday weekend like Valentine's Day. Another way the operating budget works is to identify the controllable cost needs. This means budgeting for things like food and beverages, labor, and supplies. The idea is that although the budget is forecasted to predict certain numbers, these costs can be managed in order to stay on budget, even though sales and costs might change over time. Operating budgets also note all of the non-controllable or fixed costs, things like rent, taxes, insurance, or license fees. Even though these items stay the same throughout the operating budget's time period, it is important to identify all costs. Operating budgets also identify an operation's goals and manager's performance responsibilities. This may mean a restaurant wants to hit a certain sales number every week, or that managers need to hit a certain labor number every month. When goals are set, performance expectations are made. Operating budgets build on goals by providing benchmarks over time. This gives the operation a roadmap for performance. Profit and loss reports. These are very often called P&L reports um, but, or a P&L statement. So this explains what has happened so far in maybe this month or this year or maybe this week. But so this is a compilation of our sales and cost information that's put together for that specific time period. It will tell you if you made money or if you lost money and also if you met your budget. So a P&L report will include your income, your sales from food and beverage, and any merchandise that you may sell. It also includes all of your expenses too, your food, your beverage, your labor. So a profitable uh, operation will be looking at having sales that are greater than their costs. Managers will use this report because this helps them to, uh, to build efficiency in their operation. It helps them de to determine where their costs may have increased in, the, uh, in that last period and make decisions on how to control costs without detrimental uh, effects to the business. It also helps to maintain the profitability of the overall operation. Let's take a look at our sample profit and loss report that we have here. So we start at the top, we're looking at sales. So we have our food and our beverage sales, again, broken out separately, but then combine together to give us our total sales. But this way, again, you may have a chef that's in charge of the food, and you may have a bar manager who's in charge of the beverages, and so you want to be able to hold them equally accountable to their parts of the business. Then our costs of the sales, again, we break these out 
so that we can understand if our beverage costs are too high or if our food costs are too high and if we need to identify what we need to change. This will give us our gross profit. Gross profit is our, is our overall profit from these, from taking the sales um, and then taking away the expense of those sales, giving us our gross profit. But this is before we actually take out any controlled expenses or fixed expenses which the overall business will have as well. Because we have to look at the fact that when we have things like our salaries and wages, we don't charge a person who comes in, a customer who comes in to sit in our restaurant, we don't charge them for wages for our server. This has to be wrapped into the cost of the food and the beverage they enjoy. So we have lots of items which don't have a direct sales stream involved to pay for them. And we have to account for those in the price of all of our food and beverage. So we have things like salaries and wages. We have our employee benefits, our, uh, our insurance and, in, and retirement fund. We have any legal or accounting expenses that we may have. We also have marketing costs involved in there as well. We have utility services, our gas, electricity, water, and our uh, general and administrative expenses because we have to have management and administrative uh, individuals who are recording all of these things for us, paying the bills and various things like that. Any repairs and maintenance that has to be done to, to the business structure or to the, um, or to the equipment that we have, and then possibly any other income that we may have coming in as well. So this will give us our total controlled expenses. And again, after breaking these out, we then total these together so that we know what they are overall but we keep these split out so that if there's one thing that's a little too high on any given month, uh, then we can identify that and see if it's something that we can try and uh, take better control over. Then we have our fixed expenses, our rent or our, or our mortgage bill, the depreciation, how much the value of everything that we have in our business went down during this period. And then our utility services as well, our insurance and our loan payments that we may have on any loans. We have to be able to put all of these in there, even though we may not be able to change these in any given month. So this gives us the uh, total fixed expenses as well. This is where we will then take our expenses away from our gross profit. And this gives us our profit or loss. And so in this case right here, we made $3,725. We also then have our income taxes that we have to pay and so this gives us our net earnings, which is our um, or net loss that we would have for the business. So we made three thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. If it was a loss, then we would actually put this in red, or we would also put the parentheses on either side. You see where on the loss right here, where we have parentheses. If you ever see parentheses around numbers, that means that that is a loss. As part of purchase control, we look at invoices. What is an invoice? So that's a bill for any items that we purchase. We also, <clears throat> as part of purchase control, we have to look at invoices. What is an invoice? An invoice is a bill for items that we have purchased. So we must always check our invoice for accuracy. We've got to make sure that we have the correct quantities listed on there and the correct price listed on there as well. Whoever is signing for the products coming in should always be the one who double checks this just to make sure that the right amounts have come in compared to that invoice as well. So here's an, a simple invoice that we can see from the Tiny Valley Produce Shop. And so this lists out, so we have one, River Dog Farm Heirloom Tomatoes. Uh, so we've got one case of them. It costs $31.34 per case. And so the total on that line is $31.34. So we've got one case of carrots, then $9.40 for that one case. And so the subtotal will give us another $9.40. And so on and so forth. It goes all the way down uh, through all of the items that we are purchasing from. This invoice will also list the date that it was purchased so that you can then go back and see that that was ordered during that date. A packing slip will look similar to an invoice, however it's not, and they're generally uh, separately sent in. Normally this would be sent in with the specific items that you receive. 
All it is is a list of the items. There won't be any prices on there. This is purely put in there quite often by the person who's picking these items off the shelf and putting them in the box to send them to you. But it will not have all of the other information on there. But still, this should be checked for accuracy. And here we have a good sample packing slip. So from Tony's Restaurant Supply, we got um, uh, a case here of our gloves. And so this has our part numbers on it. So it, we can identify that it was specifically the ones that we ordered. This is the large size. And so we have, uh, this comes as each. And so we got 10 boxes of these large gloves. And then the shipping quantity, we got 10 of them. Back order quantity, zero. So we received. 10 boxes of these or we should have and this is what you can check against the same with all of the other items on here you can always make sure that you have all of these items if it doesn't say back order quantity then that means this should all be in the box that you received if it's not we should make notes on that so when the invoice comes in we can put it up against it and make sure that we're invoiced for the true amount if you do receive in any inaccurate invoices or delivery items, then make sure that that invoice is corrected before the delivery truck driver leaves. Make sure that you check the purchase order and make sure that it's directly, uh, directly rounded in with the invoice as well. If the purchase order says that the person who's purchasing ordered two bottles of olive oil and the invoice shows three, then you'll need to send one back because the purchase order is what was ordered for that product. But here's a purchase order that we can see here. And so this is where we're expecting uh, to get 10 pairs of the large size gloves. And this is the specific item number for that. They should be $1.50 per unit. We've got 10 units coming in. So the invoice should reflect $15 as the cost on there. And you can take a look all the way down at all of the items. If the invoice and the actual amount that's delivered is different from this, or if the prices differ from this, then you should question this and quite possibly have it changed. Controlling costs involves us being very consistent with our quality and our portion sizes. And so this includes using pieces of equipment like ladles and portion scoops. We also use things like receiving scales when we're receiving food products in so that might be something like 10 pounds of salmon. Is it 10 pounds of salmon? Well, we're going to weigh it to make sure, just to make sure that that delivery truck driver didn't have that pound of salmon that he sliced off in the truck for his dinner for later. But also our portion scales, this is where we can make sure that the portions we're selling to our customers are accurate as well, so they're not cheated on any given time. So this is where we also control our staffing and labor costs as well by using things like time clocks. So the, uh, the employees have to come in and punch the clock in and out so that they're paid for every minute that they worked, but that we're not just randomly paying them for longer and also not shortchanging them too, but we're able to control those costs. We also have our point of sale system, which give us, gives us the ability to be able to look at all of our sales and to be able to derive lots of different reports from it so that we can actually start tracking things and working out where we can make cost savings that won't adversely affect our business as well, so that we can keep track of all of these sales. It's the manager's role to be monitoring and controlling those sales. Now these days, we have an amazing array of different options around compared to what we had years ago. So we have uh, access to email, the internet, different software programs. You can actually even invest in a full line supplier company which is a one-stop shop that provides the equipment, the food, the supplies, everything that you need. So these programs um, help us to control costs. They help us to control planning, um, uh, sorry, with cost planning, controlling sales, controlling inventory, the product that we have in the house, and also uh, helping us to focus on our menu items as well. We have software programs that help us to better access give us better access to the information that we need and give us more accurate and convenient collection of information as well and are able to actually then draw it out into usable reports that help us to be able to analyze that information and do something useful with it. We don't just want to have lots of data that we just start spewing out and producing lots of pages of printed notes on things that don't make any effect for us. 
we want to be able to use these so that we can determine where we can make good savings and where we can make improvements to our business so that the business can run more efficiently but better for the customer as well. This is a sample data analysis that can be produced from a point of sale system. And so as you can see on here, uh, we have different uh, different locations right here where the Birmingham South Side, the uh, Hoover, the Mount Brook, and then the total for the whole of the Illinois area. And so this breaks down into giving us our sales from breakfast. So we have uh, these the food sales. Again, we're breaking it down into food and beverage. And in this particular case, it's milkshakes because we serve a lot of milkshakes in the chef's kitchen. And so this helps us to identify anywhere where, where, where we have significant sales or significant expenses to be able to make those cost, um, cost savings. And so this gives us the percentage wise of our cost involved. And then so we run this along with our different areas where we are for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. And this can give us lots of information on the amount of dollars worth of sales that are coming in but also we can then take a little look through we can see any variances so as we can see at lunchtime if we're in the Birmingham South Side location so this had a 3.16 percent cost percentage involved with their beverages whereas however if you look over at the Mount Brook area right here they had a 3.13 percent cost why was their cost lower than over here in the Birmingham South Side? It could be that they have what we call a shrinkage problem, which means possibly theft going on over here. Or it could be that one of the machines went and broke down and we had some wastage from one, uh, one of the products. But this gives us an idea from an accounting standpoint where we can look and identify very quickly any problems that may be arising that we can do something about rapidly. When choosing technology, it's very important that we don't just purchase from the first person that we speak to. Every company will tell you that they have the best technology to guide you through to be able to make the biggest performance, uh, the biggest performance changes to your company. But which one is going to work best? So you have to ask yourself questions. Will it help to enhance the guest satisfaction? Will it help to increase, increase our revenue? Will it help to reduce our cost? Will it increase the employee or management productivity? Will it stop them from being bogged down having to record all these things and figure out all of these different reports that we need by just producing them automatically for us? And will it improve communication throughout our business so that we can make these improvements everywhere? So you want to jump into business, you want to be the chef owner of your restaurant, you want to open up a patisserie and be serving wonderful pastries and you're going to make a, make a fortune doing it, right? Well, how about let's look at this statistic from CNBC.com where they say that around 60% of new restaurants will fail within their first year. So that's 60% of, the, of these individuals who have a dream. They want to have their own establishment, and this is what they've wanted all their lives. 
Well, you can do it, and it can be you, but you don't want to be part of that 60%. You want to be part of the 40% that succeeds, and you also want to be part of the even smaller percentage that really thrives and succeeds in this um, on a tremendous scale. The only way you can do this is to have cost control in your establishment. And to do that, you have to understand it and be able to monitor it and make it work for you. I hope this has been useful. I'll see you in the kitchen soon. Cheers.